That's what you have for breakfast every day, right? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. That's a lot of protein, Tom. Crunch it. Yeah. Uh, you can chew it out. Is it nasty? Oh, man. <laughs> 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 no, you remind me of that bald dude. What's his name? <laughs> oh my god, that was nasty. <laughs> oh. It's manatee. Oh my god, check you out. Hey, baby. Say hola. Hola, Estados Unidos. Oh, I see the little hairs on here. I almost lost my finger that time. Yeah, again, Upstairs? Yes, up in the parlor. Yeah, yeah falcons and yeah. Uh, owls and everything. Yeah, eagle owl. And then a few black Angus steaks later, we're buddies. And uh, now there's a limitation to it. For instance, there's not a hawk or a falcon or an eagle in the world that can see anything at night. As soon as the sun goes down, they're gone. Wherever they start to dead. Believe it or not, 50 or 60 years ago, if you saw a hawk or any bird of prey uh, and you killed it, the, the government would pay you. Uh, there was, you know, even up to the 1950s. Over here, Ayla's going to help us out with something else here. Um, might as well grab her first. Yeah. Now, actually, before we move on, is anybody here from the Child Protective Services? He's a ringer on the floor. All right. You always tie the knot so tight. I tie the knot tight so she gets embarrassed. It takes a lot to open it. Got it? Yep. We already got people running. This young lady here, you stay right there. This young lady here is um, is actually an albino Burmese python, and uh, honestly, she is she is still a baby yet. She should have a, a binky, a bow, and a bonnet right now. Um, this animal, full grown, is going to measure over 20 feet long, uh, weigh, weigh about 230 pounds, and uh, and they eat, eat, they eat, and they get huge. Now, an incredible part about this is being that it's albino, and thank God it was born in captivity, because, see, it's an incredible thing about snakes is as soon as they're born, whether or not it's uh, uh, an egg layer like this or a lie born, they're self-sufficient. And now I say technically self-sufficient, because basically they really don't know what they're doing and they're sc scared to death. So the first thing they do as soon as they're born is they hide. And the way they hide is they use that camouflage and they blend in with their environment. And then they figure out life from there. A snake like this has no ability to do that. You know, when she was born, she hatched out. She probably was only about 14 inches long. And this is an animal that comes from the green jungles of Thailand. And you don't want to be trying to hide in the green jungles of Thailand looking like that. Uh, they fall prey immediately, really, to many other things because of that inability to hide. 
Uh, the first thing people notice when they see snakes is the way they stick their tongue in and out. That's how snakes smell. Now right here is the smell that's used holding them, but in the wild they do smell for their food. Um, and when they see something that they want, they're going to quick coil back their head and they bite. I stress the fact that they do bite. And the reason I do is that there's many times I'm doing a lecture and later on someone will just come up to me and, and start petting her on her head like she's a labradoodle or something. <laughs> and I say, you know, it's not really a good idea because if some snakes are what's called head shy, and if you touch the head, they're going to bite you. And with the utmost confidence, they say, oh no, this is a python. They squeeze their food. They don't bite. And that's really, really wrong. I got a lot of stitches to prove how wrong that is. Yes, they do bite. Uh, I mean, and yes, they do squeeze their food. But see, the food isn't going to volunteer to die. Uh, so they got to catch it. So they wrap it and they constrict it. Now, use the word constrict. They do not crush their prey. See, uh, I've been wrapped about nine times by adult pythons and anacondas and, and uh, uh, boas. And I, when I was, you know, kind of trying to get myself out of this situation, I did a little bit of study on what they do. It's an amazing science on how they go in for the kill. As I mentioned, they do not crush. See, crushing your prey takes too much energy. And these are the laziest animals in the world. I mean, honestly, you know how you know if a snake is hungry? It moves. <laughs> and that is it. It's not even going to bother moving it if it isn't hungry. I've seen an anaconda grab a pig off a riverbank and curl up beneath the tree later on and, and lay there for four months. They do nothing for four months. At first you think, oh, that's just a silly old snake, but it is. It's the smartest one out there. I mean, for one, it's a snake, and we got to admit, when you're a snake full of food, what are you possibly going to do with the rest of your life until you get hungry again? So there's not much for snakes to do, but the scientific reason behind it is that they cannot waste their energy. See, wasting your energy in the wild kills you. Yep. It is a, it's a, it's only the, I'm going in for a little kiss there, that's it. You see, it's only, you know, wasting, you know, food, wasting your energy in the wild kills you. It is only the humans with the treadmill. You know, and only certain types of human, like us. See, my wife's a Kukam Indian from the Peruvian Amazon, and I do a lot of work and in, in, uh, things down in the Amazon, and I always get a kick out of telling the natives of this amazing machine that we've made that makes us run as fast as we possibly can, uh, but we go nowhere. Uh, they have no clue why we do this, and they always just make me promise never to bring one down. But, but even something like a hummingbird. that A hummingbird has a brain equivalent to the uh, size of a grain of rice. But it's able to remember every flower it drinks from in a day. Because it needs to, because if it doesn't, it goes back to those empty flowers. That loss of energy within one day will kill her by nighttime. So on a slower scale, the snakes do the same thing of conserving that energy. And only moving when they have to. So what they do is when they grab something, they wrap and they get a good grab, but they're going to hold on and they're going to see how the prey reacts. Because you know, any animal they've ever grabbed, the first thing it does is it goes <gasps> like that because it's in shock and it's trying to fight for its life. Well, what the snake will do is get a good hold and then wait till the prey needs to exhale. And when the prey exhales and the lungs and the ribcage contract and get small, small there, the snake just needs to hold it in that position. And really the prey smothers themselves. They have to waste all that energy in crushing because uh, they need that energy in eating. They'll expend more energy in swallowing their food in one hour than they will for the next month or two. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge process because everything goes down whole. I mean, this, this little boy here will swallow a full-grown rooster whole. It'll take about an hour and a half to do it, but uh, he gets it down. This is also one that um, has kind of been wreaking havoc down south uh, because of the uh, people releasing them. Uh, there was free market on, uh, on these for a while, on buying these. Uh, and they get big, as I said, a couple hundred pounds, almost 20 feet, sometimes over. And people release them. Now, if you release one up here, honestly, the first winter night's going to kill them. But, you know, down in Georgia and Florida areas, you know, the ecosystem is so close to their natural habitat, they're thriving. And they're becoming a nuisance species and eating bird life, even eating young alligators and everything. Uh, so it's been an issue right now. Uh, and this is something, though, I do not recommend as pets uh, because of that size. Uh, and I've seen one smaller than this kill people. Um, any questions about the snake? Now, coming to the conclusion why lots of people do not like snakes, there's a big word called anthropomorphism. That's when you give animals human qualities, and that's easy to do, because some animals are cute, and some are cuddly, and some look like us, but it's just not going to work with this thing. There's nothing human about this thing at all. And for one, they, they do not have eyelids, so they always look like they're staring at you. And that makes people nervous. Now, she's not going to break out a smile anytime soon, so you don't know if she had a bad day or not, uh, if she's in a good mood. 
when I have them, you know, when they're on you, uh, you can feel by the way they move and the way they breathe, kind of what's on their mind. But most people don't want to figure that out by wrapping it around their neck. Uh, so that's usually out. So you know, that's why we like things that are cute and cuddly and things we can relate to, and that's why we make movies called Free Willy. I'll guarantee you, Free Snakey will not be a theater near you anytime soon. You know, they get things like snakes on the plane. And, but for the amount I travel, you know, that would be the most exciting flight I've ever had in my entire life. You know, there's nothing more boring than sitting in a chair for eight hours. Uh, if there was full of snakes, at least we'd have something to do. But you can see with her not being nasty, not trying to bite, and I do trust her very much. And the reason is it's... <laughs> now, this here, this is Brisa. Now, Brisa is a, a Harris hawk, and also known as a bay wing hawk, and also known as a dusty hawk. Now, but as I said, they're the only gregarious hawk in the world. And what I mean by that is that they are the, they're the only social hawk. Uh, these guys actually live in social families, and they hunt in packs like wolves do. And the only species of, of hawk that does that. See, if you study hawks, what will happen, you'll quickly find out that all do, although they do mate for life, they're always about a day from divorce. Yeah, one's in one tree looking that way, one's in another tree looking this way, and they're not cuddlers, and they're together for some higher reason. Uh, but these guys are a little bit different, so they have that, uh, that social uh, statue. And, and the odd part with that is that it's, it's believed they do that because one of their staple foods is a black-tailed jackrabbit. Now, a big female black-tailed jackrabbit will be bigger than her. And, uh, but she's not eating. It, it looks like she is in a minute, but right here. And she's not eating. What, what she's doing now, because she's eaten already like four times today, what she's doing is she's cutting the food up into little pieces and she's saving it for later. Because right above her stomach she has something called a crop. And what a crop is, is a storage area. So what she can do is she can eat till her stomach gets full. And when her stomach is jam packed full of food to where we would have to stop, or at least we really should be stopping, uh, they don't. And they keep on eating and they fill up this crop full of food. When that crop is full, it looks like a big golf ball on the neck. Uh, it's a meatball. So what will happen is when she gets hungry again, she has muscles that push the food out of the crop and fill the stomach up a second time. So, as I mentioned, that 80% mortality rate, that's a very strong adaptation for them because if food gets scarce, you know, they never know when the next meal is going to be coming around. So what they could do is kind of store a bit so that if they do have to go a few days without eating, uh, they'll be able to do it. Is it only that kind of crop? Well, they have, the other one has it too. Actually, all hawks have it. Uh, eagles have that crop. The only one that's actually lacking crops is owls. Yeah. But they do something different. I have an owl at home, and he doesn't have a crop. So what I do is, you know those cinder blocks, the little three-hole cinder blocks? I stick one in the corner uh, of, his chamber, of his chamber there, so he'll eat whatever he wants, and anything he has left over, he'll fly down, and he sticks it in the hole of the, of the cinder block to, for later because uh, they don't have that crop. Now you see that band there, though? When they're captive bred, that little band on the leg has a serial number. So when they're captive bred, they all have that. And so I mentioned before that one hawk that swiped the hand. Now this is a snake that comes from down where, uh, where I have a place in the Amazon. You mentioned I... Uh, about eight or nine years ago, I visited the Amazon to write a sequel for a book I wrote called The Twilight of the Wild. As soon as my boots hit the ground, I just really fell in love with the place. And um, so I started going back, study as much as I can, uh, leading some trips down there. Um, I actually met my wife there. She's a Kukam Indian from the Peruvian Amazon. And uh, then I do a program that uh, we just started called Nets for Ninos, where we bring in malaria nets. Uh, uh, to babies that live in, in, the, uh, in the remote villages. It's to this day, 3,000 children every day die of malaria. Uh, and just to wrap them up in a net, and it's just a ten, little $10 net, uh, really saves lives. So it's just something that I really love doing down there. And uh, so this is kind of a species that comes from that area. Uh, there's a little boa. This is Oreo. See, the belly looks like cookies and cream ice cream. <laughs> So you name Oreo, and this was a wedding gift, and the only wedding gift I actually use. <laughs> now, 
very, very much like the pythons, but there are some differences too. For instance, these are lie bearers, uh, where the, the pythons are the egg layers. Uh, and this is a, an arboreal snake. And what I mean by that is it, it's a tree, it's a tree dwelling snake. You know, we have some snakes that just grow up in the uh, uh, in the water. Some grow up under my hat. Uh, but some grow up in the water. Uh, some are kind of semi-aquatic, and they like going back and forth from the land. Some are ground snakes, and some are tree snakes. This is a snake that amazingly can be born in a tree, can spend its entire life in a tree, die in a tree, never ever to touch the ground. Everything it needs, they can get out of the trees. Now, to be an arboreal snake, you have to be extremely adapted for it because it is an extremely unstable environment up there. You know, branches are always breaking, especially in the jungle with we have some, you know, some of our water levels are going. Uh, there's places that, you know, on my preserve where you can walk one time of the year and yet next time of the year uh, you're canoeing 40 feet up in the treetops. Uh, it's a 30 to 40 foot rise in, in the water level. With that, trees are falling because of the soft ground and everything. So an animal like this really needs to be perfectly adapted. Uh, for life up in trees. And it amazingly is. You can watch this, for instance. I'll show you this. Check this out. <laughs> yeah, and she won't fall. And that is the prehensile tail. You see how she takes that tail and wraps it right around my hand. It's no different than a branch if she was up into a, in a tree. Now, if I did that with a ground boa, it'd end up in the lake. But. From having that prehensile tail, that's a little, little safety uh, thing there. She'll wrap it around that branch and uh, feel safe that she's not going to fall. Every snake in the world has a fear of falling. I think it's not having hands or legs thing that'll do it. You, know, you fall hard then. Uh, so they always want to feel safe that they're not going to fall. That's why people ask me, like, if other people hold snakes, do they act differently? Quite honestly, this animal is so instinctual uh, that if it feels comfortable around people, and, you know, if it feels comfortable around me, it would feel comfortable being held by you. If you hold it right. If you don't, and it doesn't feel stable enough, and it feels like it's going to fall, uh, that's when you might get bit because it's getting nervous. But otherwise, they really have no uh, no difference between no no difference between other people. Uh, and if they're good with one, they're going to be good with the rest of them. Any questions for them? Where do you keep them? Where I keep them? Well, the snakes are in basement area because they have to be under controlled heat. Uh, a lot of these, you know, being cold bloody, you got to keep them, you know, sometimes 85 to 90 degrees. Uh, the birds of prey are outdoors uh, in all flight chambers. They prefer the outdoors anyway. Uh, but they're all there. But I've had a basement like most people's nightmares. <laughs> My fire department would have called me one time. They said, Rusty, if your house ever catches on fire, we're not coming. Yeah. <laughs> grab, what's, uh, grab what's special to you and, and we're going to shut the roads down and let it burn. That happened one time. I actually had the gas company uh, was putting in uh, uh, putting in natural gas, but when they left, somehow the valve jammed. It started spilling out over, and it started going to the basement where I was writing my book. And it was like the textbook situation. I started getting sleepy. I decided to take a nap. I didn't realize I was you know dying in a way. Um, well, luckily my neighbor heard it and he he called 911 and then. And my dog started barking when the fire department showed up. All right, we'll get you guys. Your right hands good? Yep. Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. Make sure you hang on. He's not going to do it, Sam. Ah! I knew it. Can you tell the difference? Yeah, oh, definitely different personalities. The way you really tell the difference between them is a lot in the movements. Here it's, it's a very fluid movement. When you're holding them, if they're not comfortable, they're almost going to be backtracking on you and they're going to be moving in, in more contorted areas. Like they're, instead of just hanging here, they're more struggling. And then, then you, of course, by the, the telltale hissing and, and that, that's usually a giveaway. But a lot of it, like this is a very comfortable pose here, just like it was up in a tree. But one that was stressed wouldn't look like that at all. Uh, they'd really be kind of trying to squirm their way out of, of being in, in someone's hands. Um, Rusty, yes. do they show affection? Uh, no. I wish, I, uh, I wish they did, but they, do, they don't. Uh, very instinctual animals. Honestly, you know, when they're on my neck and looking very comfortable, they're enjoying the old 98.6 degrees of me being uh, cold-blooded. Uh, they, they want that, that heat from, uh, uh, from anything. So you could tame them, 
But as far as affection, the day's going to come and it's going to be your turn to take care of what we have. You know, if you can realize how important it is and why we need it, uh, then I'm sure you guys will do a much better job than we've done. So I hope everybody had a good time. I'd like to thank you all for gathering around. Bye. 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 Coming. Nice one. That's a nice one. Yeah. Why don't you? Bye. You want to eat one, Dad? What? Grub? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Thanks for asking, though. I'll have one. Me too. A little coconut grub. Yeah, see, I like these much better than the roasted ones. Mm -hmm. the roasted ones make me puke. That's a ugh, do that. Remember, there's no rocks here, so if you step on something hard. Run your ass off. Figure it out later. Yeah. Probably just a big tarapa. Big tarapa. We made it. <laughs> We're not there yet. We got a couple more feet to go. They almost wiped out there. Ugh. Damn it. I'm gonna get up front so I can uh, shoot. Yeah, back. good. See you by for now. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat>
You sit right there. I'll shoot later. So just peed on her. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I hope that's good luck. Yeah. For the eels. <laughs> good luck for the eels. Hola, oh, Mary. Oh, you said we can do Nice to meet you. She's the wife and the little daughter. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Okay. Oh my gosh, look at that Electric eel. Oh yeah, that's a cool and square job. Ah, ah, yeah. Okay, bro, okay. It's a part of the problem for the load. Ah, it's not okay. Wow, you have the crawler. That's great. Mm -hmm. Let's crush them all up. Keep the bugs away. Mm. Nature's off. Yeah. Well, right so termites used for insect repellent. type of human like us. So they get the biggest kick of telling all the natives in the Amazon of this amazing machine that we've made that makes us run as fast as we possibly can, but we go nowhere. They have no clue why we do this to ourselves. And they just make me promise never to bring one down. Uh, but even something like a hummingbird. A hummingbird has a brain equivalent to the size of a grain of rice. But amazingly, it's able to Remember, every single flower it drinks from in a day, it needs to. Because if it doesn't, it starts going back to those empty flowers. That loss of energy within one night will kill her by nighttime. So on a slower scale, this next to the same thing of, of uh, you know, really controlling and conserving that, that energy. Um, now, you see, when I use a bag, I travel, I use a bag here. 
Now, the reason I use the bag is because their, their skin's very fragile. If you put them in something uh, you know, hard, uh, like a box, uh, and you're moving around a lot, what will happen is they'll move around and they'll start uh, you're rubbing up against the edges and they'll get a cut or a sore on their skin and a, a cut that may take you six or seven days to heal and make them six or seven months to heal. So it's a very slow healing process. So the, uh, uh, the bag works out good to keep them uh, you know, nice, and, uh, nice and soft. Now this is an arboreal snake, which means it spends its life in trees. Now in order to do that, it's gotta be extremely adapted because uh, you know, it's a very unstable environment out there. The wind's blown, branches are breaking, leaves are falling. Uh, so this is a perfectly adapted for life up in a tree. Watch this. So, and she won't fall. So you got a prehensile tail. That tail there actually acts like a hand. If that was a, a ground snake, she would have smacked up against the window back there. But uh, the, the tree snakes, they will hold on with that prehensile tail uh, and hang on to be safe that they won't fall. So anyway, the whole secret though with the bag when you put them in there, you gotta tie the knot. Anybody tells you they have experience keeping snakes, they also mean that they have experience losing snakes. Because you lose them. They are Houdinis of the animal world and you lose them. Now, the whole problem with losing them isn't losing them actually. That's not too bad of a situation if you lose them. It's just the fact that they come back again. And they will show up at the wrong and the worst possible times. And you will be amazed at what you can lose. I'm constantly amazed at what I can lose. Uh, my record so far, I actually lost a... Uh, <laughs> I lost an 18 foot long python. And, uh, and I lost it in a 20 foot room. It's 200 pounds, no less. It was 18 feet long, 200 pounds. It was my bedroom. Kind of knew the place. Took me almost four hours to find out that she was in my stereo speaker. I didn't even know it. I didn't even see her. It was just that the speaker was 200 pounds heavier than it's supposed to be. So I figured she was in there. But I'm kind of a procrastinator, so I let her stay in there. And I went off and did a couple other things. And so when I come back, I'll get you. And I came back. And of course, she was gone. And uh, it took me about another hour or two to find out that my sofa was uh, 200 pounds heavier than it should have been. And she was sleeping in it, which is horrible. Because she wasn't on top of it and she wasn't beneath it, she was in it. Uh, see, before the snake was there, I had a pair of ferrets. Now, ferrets, the word ferret, actually, the name ferret comes from the Latin word ferritus, which means little furry thief. That's what they are. They steal everything. Uh, and what my ferrets did is in that little felt that's beneath the sofa, they cut all in there. And then anything in the house they could possibly get their teeth on, they would steal. And then they would jam it up inside of my sofa. They sense of God, and then I had this little hole remained, and I had this snake there. And she ended up in there. But the problem is an 18 foot python inside of a sofa, you can't get them out. You don't pull them out. They're all in the springs and stuff. So you gotta wait till they come out on their own. A snake that size that only leaves when they get hungry, but only eats once a month. So uh, we kind of had to wait. And the thing when I learned about myself that actually amazed me is I, I realized that I actually had the ability uh, to forget that I had a 200 pound snake living in my sofa. Even when I'd sit and watch TV, I forgot it was there. I didn't really forget, if someone mentioned it, I didn't remember, you know, but it was on the back burner. Yeah, I knew she'd come out at some point, and uh, she did. <laughs> when I bring a company home, and now I have a 200 pound snake sleeping on my sofa who hasn't eaten in a month. So you gotta tie those knots, so you will get out. I brought one more additional snake with me today, and this one's really cool. This was a rescue, actually. Uh, I just got her not too long ago. She wasn't doing too well, and I rescued her. And she's uh, bouncing back really good. But the thing I really like to talk about with her is, um, is the way she was when she was born. See, the amazing part about snakes is that they are technically self-sufficient as soon as they're born. Now, some snakes are born by the egg, some are live bearers, either or. As soon as they are alive and out, uh, they are on their own. I use the word technically because they don't have the slightest clue what they're doing, and they're terrified. So what they do is they hide. As soon as they're born, they hide. And then they figure it out from there. Uh, and this one, though, the way that they hide, though, is they use their colors, their camouflage. 
uh, the hive and their surroundings, um, and it works perfectly for them. This one that you're about to see, though, thank God, was bred in captivity because it, uh, due to a genetic uh, mutation, it was, uh, it has no ability to hide from anything. There, now, and she's an albino. This is a Burmese python, and she's a baby. She'd have a banky, a bonnet, and a bow right now. She is a baby. Uh, this, uh, this young lady, full grown, is gonna be about 20 feet long and weigh over 225 pounds. Now, she's about 40 pounds right now. She'll put on almost another 200 pounds on top of what she is, and, and double, if not almost triple in length. Uh, now, they don't normally look like this. As I said, this is an albino. The typical Burmese python is some dark olive greens and browns and blacks, uh, very mottled color. Perfect for living in a jungle. These are ones that come from Thailand area, Indonesia, Burma. And, uh, but when they hatch out, they're only about 18 inches long. Imagine being 18 inches long in a green jungle of Thailand looking like this. Uh, they don't last a day. There's always something, whether it be a hawk or some type of medium-sized mammal, that's going to eat them really quickly. So they do not live long at all uh, in captivity. Um, this is also the, one of the species that is wreaking havoc down south. People would, it was a very, people would get them as pets. I honestly do not recommend them as pets because, as I said, they get very big and they eat a lot. I've, had, I've known people killed by, by snakes smaller than this. Uh, they are so, so powerful. And as I said, they eat a lot. Every three weeks, this thing eats a full-grown rooster. Uh, they, you know, they, they wolf them down. And what happens, they get so big, people get afraid of them, they let them go. Now, you let them go up here, one New York winter's night is going to kill them. But down in Florida and Georgia area, and they're loving it. It's perfect habitat for them. And they're living in the Everglades, and they're doing very, very well, and they're actually establishing and breeding down there and even eating young alligators. And they're becoming a nuisance sparrow species, so they're actually going out and killing them. Uh, and now they have a lot more regulations on them. So something I don't recommend as a pet. That bow that you saw, that would be a really cool pet, but uh, these uh, really don't, just because of the size and all the, and the danger factor. But I come up with the conclusion why lots of people do not like snakes. It's a big word called anthropomorphism. That's when you give animals human qualities, you compare them to us. That's easy to do. Some animals are cute and cuddly and some even look like us. They're the ones that we go for. There's nothing human like this at all. For one, they don't have any eyelids, so they always look like they're staring at you. That freaks people out. And they're not going to break out a smile anytime soon. So you don't know what's on their mind or if they had a bad day. I can tell when they're on me, where they breathe and whether they move. But a lot of people don't want to figure that out by wrapping around their neck. So that's out. So again, we like things cute and cuddly, and things we can relate to, and that's why we make movies called Free Willy. And uh, I will assure you, Free Snakey will not be at a theater near you anytime soon uh, because of that, that cuteness factor. Now, they seem very slimy, but they're not. The skin on every snake is no different than your hair or your fingernails. Uh, and they always, always appear to be different. They're uh, exactly the same. And then let's see if we can back you up. Yeah, I'm waiting. Are you going to help? Howdy. Now, see, this is the part that you can struggle at all day and no one will help you. Yeah. Hey, buddy. Try that up. Now, there's a Nazi. She got, she was a rescue. What happened was that uh, whoever, whoever had her before was feeding her live food, and uh, actually it's feeding her live rabbits, and uh, it's not what I do. Plus, I don't feed them live to begin with. See, for years, got my first steak when I was six years old, and I always read, they only eat live, they only eat live. And I figured, you know what, they got the brain the size of a pig. If I can't trick them, it's not saying much for myself, so, you know what, Cody. if it's the same temperature, and it smells right, and you wiggle it right, they'll eat it. 
Uh, so they eat uh, pretty much anything as long as you, you tempt them properly with it. So, uh, but what happened was that he was feeding them live, and he, they, they grabbed um, the animal, and it got, and the animal bit it back. Very common, and it got blood poisoning. And the blood poison is really nasty. It looks like a bruise, but then the bruise lifts and, and then it gives lesions. It looks like just sores going on. Uh, if you notice, when he flaps his wings, uh, you're not going to hear it. Uh, around the edges, you'll feel it. It's kind of like Flintstones air conditioning. 